Good morning. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would just stir our hearts as we look at your word. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you've given us your word, that it's been good through the ages, that it's good for now and will be good for eternity. We just pray that you'd stir our hearts now because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this morning you were supposed to, or for this morning, you were supposed to do a biographical study on three characters. The three characters that you did the study on are the three, uh, the most material on these three people uh, in the book of Philippians. Uh, and this is uh, one element or one type of a biographical study that you're, you've been doing. One of the things that you're going to discover as you, you bring different Bible study methods to the table is that once you learn the method, and it's worth laboring in it until you get the method down, once you learn the method, even when you're not using the method, you automatically will use the method. And so if you get in the habit of using the biographical method, for instance, and you're studying a book, you automatically will be in the, your subconscious, you'll automatically be picking up the biographical information and asking a question. What will be the question? Okay, what contribution does this material make to my understanding of the book? Now, a lot of it will be none, because it's just a mention of a character, a greeting, or something of this nature. Although even that may give you insight, because you may say, oh, uh, Titus was there, or whatever. Uh, the book of Acts is interesting because of the use of pronouns. Uh, as you go through, you can tell whether or not Luke was there. How? Pardon? Say us. Yeah, he'll, he'll either say they went here or they'll say we went there or us or whatever the, whatever the pronoun. And so uh, you'll automatically be able to make these shifts if, you're, if you've become conscious of it. So it, the method isn't only if you're using that method. What it's trying to do is to sharpen your senses so you bring all of this to light on the particular area that you're, that you're studying. Uh, and uh, I would guess now we're about, I think, halfway through on methods. Uh, and uh, so we've just begun, you know, we're only halfway. And you probably have spent more time on the book of Philippians and absorbed more and done more independent study on the book of Philippians than you have most of the books that you've studied. Uh, and uh, where is it coming from? This is the exciting thing about it. The information that you're gathering and what you're simulating from the book of Philippians. What's the real exciting thing about it? Yeah, it's from your own study. You're studying the Bible, you're not studying about the Bible. This isn't Joe's opinion, this is Donna's opinion. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're drawing your own conclusions by that. And then when you see something that's true, that somebody else says, that's gonna delight you too. Because you're going to say, hey, I didn't see that before, and they're accurate that it's a legitimate, there's a set of notes over there that you may want to pick up. Uh, there are two piles, one's from last week, one's from this week, uh, and uh, that'll help you to, to stay tuned here. Okay, so what we're doing now is looking at these three characters, and as we look through the, the information that we have on them, we're going to find that that will, again, give us light on the book, an understanding of the book, and also an understanding of the people uh, that are involved and what's going on. 
So uh, just kind of looking at this, let's kind of run through with Paul. Uh, what, what biographical facts did you pick up? We looked at the well, first one last time. Uh, he was the author of the book. Uh, if we jump over to Timothy for just a second, he was a companion of Paul as Paul is writing the book. He's with Paul at that present time. Let's go back to Paul again. What's the next thing you picked up? He's in prison. Pardon? He's in prison. He's in prison. Where did you get that? Uh, 12 and 13. Okay, 12 and 13. Did anybody have, and that's uh, in prison for Christ. Did anybody have anything between 1-1 and uh, 10 and 13? You've got three there before. Thankful individual, love the Philippians, and man of Okay, those were already... Okay, I, okay, good. And then he was in prison for Christ. All right? I got a, one in verse 6 that you didn't give us that talked about his faith in the future. He was looking... Um, okay. Okay, and that was one six. Yeah. And Gary, you had picked it up again later too. Oh, I jumped ahead. I don't want to get. No, that's all right. Where was it? Uh, three thirteen to fourteen. Basically, it's forward looking. Saying what was in the past in the past. Okay. Now, see, this is exciting. The, the, I hadn't picked that one up, so I'm. Uh, that's the again. Uh, you're studying, particularly as you bring the different methods to bear, uh, is a tremendous fellowship point where you can do, where you can talk about what you what you're discovering, and the other person will have picked up uh, insights that you may have missed or overlooked. Okay. Would you say in verse five because he says because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now? So I wrote down you had a partnership. With the Philippians. Not only did he write to them, but he had. Okay. But maybe that's redundant. <laughs> uh, no, that's that's very legitimate. Know which one is important, isn't it? Like, well, it's just a fact about him, and that's what we have. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Another. Uh, let's see. Then we had in prison for Christ. Anything else before thirteen? Verse thirteen of chapter one. Okay, what's the next one somebody has? Philippians, in verse 8, I long after you all in Jesus Christ. Okay, what was the reference there? 8, and, and he had that on his Okay, yeah, love the Philippians. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. And then did you have in verse 9, he yearned for the Philippians? Uh... No, I. Okay, I put that under part of the love of the Philippians, but uh, and it it's fine to split it out too, or, or if you had a main point there and this is a supporting text, that's good too. All right, what's the next one that somebody had? Do it again real loud. Uh, verse 16, he was approved for the defense of the gospel. Okay. By the swords of encouragement on 14. Uh, what was it, Gary? Swords of encouragement on 14. My Bible said he was patient in 14. Carol, would you do that once more? My Bible said he was patient in verse 14. Okay. Good. Okay, anybody, what's the next thing after 15?
Okay. Uh, that basically, we kind of pick that up in other facets too, that 10 to 13, that he was in prison for Christ. Okay? Uh, after 15. <laughs> okay, Re do it once more. Uh, anything at what's after 18? Uh, do it again. Okay. All right. Uh, That whole uh, 2021 kind of are, are together, there are these things, and uh, to live was Christ for Paul. He, uh, but these things are feeding into the same, the same thing. Okay? Okay. Um, did I that? Yeah, uh, you did, and that would probably go into that same future-oriented, optimistic about what was going to come. Okay. Uh, what after twenty-one? Okay. Anybody else? Anything right through there? Good. Anything after what was that? What was that reference, Gary? Twenty-one to six. Twenty-one to six. Okay. Anybody else have anything there? Uh, what after twenty-six? Okay, uh, at 27, he anticipated the faithfulness of the Philippians. All right, anything, what's after that, after 27? Okay. Uh, 30, he was an example of suffering for Christ. Uh, what after 30? In, go away to 2, 12 through 18, where it's, uh, it's a confidence builder. He was confident. Let's see, drop your mask and say it. Confidence builder. Confident, he was a confident builder. Confidence, like building their confidence. In, in oh, competent builder, okay. Confident. Confident. F-I-D. He built their confidence. Uh, 
I had in 2 2 that he had joy in like mindedness. He had joy when things, when there was unity there. And then, okay, uh, after uh, 2 2, and what Gary had given to. Uh, I had in 2.16 that he wanted an enduring ministry. He wanted a ministry that endured. Uh, looking back on ministry, I think this is one of the, uh, one of the great joys if you're a Sunday school teacher or whatever, when you run on to somebody that you impacted and it's been years and they're still going for the Lord. Uh, because you you deal with a lot of people who don't finish well you know they take off and then crash uh, and just the 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 uh, when you run on to somebody I've got one guy who's real faithful touches base with me about once a year and I got an email from him and he said it's been 50 years since I came to know Christ and he's still living for the Lord. He's been a deacon at the church and everything. And uh, you're, you're just, you know, when, the, when you have an enduring ministry, because I look at back so many shipwrecks, <laughs> uh, those that really haven't endured and go on uh, is really uh, uh, a neat thing. Uh, I think the Lord must have thought I needed encouragement or something, or Shirley and I, because... We've had about three people contact us from, you know, that we ministered to back in 1970. And they're still uh, living for the Lord and uh, everything. And a guy described, just yesterday I got an email and he said, was talking about the impact uh, that had been made on him. And he, he said, I married a, a lovely girl who had grown up at Ashburn Lutheran. Uh, but then ended up at Ashburn Baptist, and they've been married now. He's got grandkids, so it's been a long time. But uh, that enduring ministry really means a great deal. Uh, and you teach a Sunday school class, and then you run on to somebody that you, uh, that you impacted. And often, it's, uh, this is another interesting thing, often the people who influence most aren't the people that you think would. I asked a group of college students one time who impacted them the most. And uh, the, one, the name that came up the most often was Bertha Schlins. She had never married, she took care of her mother, never married, but had taught the primary age forever. And her name came up more often. It wasn't one of the pastors or youth leaders or anything. It was Bertha Schlins came up more often uh, than what anybody else's did that she had had the most impact upon them. So he wanted an enduring ministry. Uh, in 20 and 21, he was concerned for their welfare. He had a concern for the welfare of these people. Did anybody have anything before 21? Okay, willing to die for the Philippians. This is fun. You're you're picking up a lot of things that I missed. Uh, it's a uh, it's neat. Uh, in three, four to six, he had a flawless Hebrew background. However, we, you might word that. That that a lot of ways you could word that one. Anything before 3.3? Three, three. Well, in 3.1, I said that he was diligent in writing. He says, I don't mind writing this stuff again. Okay. <laughs> Repetition. Okay. Uh, anything, what's the next thing after 3.6? In 3.8, I had to know Christ was his highest goal. Uh, that's interesting because if you kind of reflect, uh, if I ask myself, what's my highest goal? It's 
my highest goal to get something new or to accumulate or you know or even good health or whatever what's my highest goal and uh, Paul's highest goal was to know Christ Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, what after three eight? Okay. 3.11 was an interesting one too, that he strived to attain to the resurrection of the dead. This is an interesting one because we tend, a lot of the best things are impossible. Uh, I want, I have a goal uh, to be the best husband that I can be, or the best father. Okay, will I ever <laughs> be the perfect husband? Will I ever be the perfect father? No. What do we tend to do if we can't reach perfection? Forget about it. Forget about it. <laughs> we tend to back off. So though I can never be the perfect husband, I ought to be continually striving to be the perfect husband. Though I can never be the perfect father, I ought to be continually striving to be the perfect father. Though I can never attain to the resurrection, well, I will attain to the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> but Paul was trying to do it when? Now, now. He wanted to, to experience in his life what he would experience at the resurrection of the dead. Where would all his focus be after the resurrection of the dead? On God, on Christ. Uh, will he be falling victim to sin? No. Uh, so he and so we need to strive for the things that, uh, even though we can't reach it, that ought to be our, our consistent uh, forward thrust. Uh, the, uh, okay, what next? In 317 and in 49, I had that he encouraged people to follow him. Ah, isn't that one, now it's follow me as what? as I follow Christ, that was the thing. But uh, a verse that has meant a, a great deal to me going way back uh, is Psalm 34, 1, where David wrote, and he says, Come ye children, hearken unto me, and I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. Come ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Uh, there are two things there. Uh, their responsibility and mine, what's theirs? To listen, to, listen, to hearken, to give in, to learn. Uh, what's my responsibility? <laughs> and what I giving them, will it produce the fear of the Lord? Uh, and if they, if they look at my example, will it teach them to fear God? If, I, if they listen to my teaching, will it teach them to fear God? Come ye children, hearken unto me, and I'll teach you the fear of God. And so it has a dual uh, responsibility there. So he was encouraging people to follow him. Uh, in uh, 3.30, this is a, a this was an interesting one because I picked it up late uh, as I was just kind of reflecting back on the text. I picked up this one. I 
uh, <laughs> what is it? There's no, th well, I mean, I was, like I said, I was thinking originally, you know, <laughs> <laughs> creatively. Uh, it, let me find it now. Uh, Yeah, it, it, he experienced emotional turmoil. Uh, I'll, I'll have to chase the reference down. Uh, I, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I wonder, what's 4-3? Somebody have text right there? Okay, that's not it. Well, he says in verse 28 uh, about being eager to send Timothy or Tepherdite. Uh, and he says, so that you may rejoice again when you see him, and I may be less anxious. Okay, that's where. What's the reference? Okay, 228 is where that one, that's the reference. I think it goes on to say, thirdly, I beseech you, brethren, that you be Good, good. That's, a, that's the reference. 228, that he experienced emotional turmoil. Uh, I tend to think of, of the Apostle Paul just kind of waltzing through his, uh, his, his work. Uh, uh, when I when I came to faith, I followed uh, a fellow who had uh, a really good guy, he, but he had he had uh, had an affair and had resigned. When I came on the scene, there was all kinds of pastoral distrust, and I had a really a rough three years. Uh, if they would have asked for my resignation, I would have kissed him. Uh, uh, but I just didn't feel like I'd walk off, but boy, I sure wanted to. And there was a pastor nearby who had followed where there had been an affair, and I, I thought, man, he just walked right through this. Just, you know, and I called him and asked him if I could uh, buy him lunch. I just wanted to learn what he... And I had lunch with him, and I found out he... <laughs> he had to wrestle through all of the same things that I had to wrestle through. And we, we tend to think others just waltz through their Christian life. But we all have things that we've got to deal with, we've got to live through. And Paul said that I could be less anxious. And you don't think of Paul as being an anxious person. But he did experience emotional turmoil. And so we're kind of at home uh, with him. Uh, uh, anybody else have anything in that neighborhood? Uh, the three, uh, going forward from 317. Three, uh, 411, he had learned contentment. He had learned contentment. Uh, is that an easy thing to learn? No. To really back off and say, hey, I, I'm content. Uh, and as you get older, what happens? What do you realize? I was preaching through uh, Ecclesiastes and uh, with an older congregation, and a fellow 87 at that time came up to me, and he said, boy, can I relate to this. He said, I've been an optimist all my life, but now I realize it isn't going to get any better. Economically, flat. Well, it could get worse, particularly because of inflation and that. But economically, flat. Health? You know, is he going to get in better health? Yeah. Unlikely. He, he, may, uh, he may be able to do something to offset some aging, but unlikely. Is he apt to become more mentally alert? 
is the app to hear any better? <laughs> you know, and that's a very frustrating thing when you're a teacher and you can't hear. Uh, you want to interact with the class and everything, but you can't hear what <laughs> what's going on. Yeah, ever, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, Paul had learned contentment. Uh, Thirteen, he had the conviction that he could do all things through Christ. Uh, and uh, much of what he's talking about there is going through problems. Uh, it isn't just that I can. Uh, teach a Sunday school class or anything God just going to enable me to do that uh, he's talking about his whole living uh, 16 just a, a, a biographical thing he had been in Thessalonica so that's just something you learned about Paul he'd been in Thessalonica and the Philippians had contributed to his support while he was there Okay, anybody have anything else from? In verse 14, he said, it was kind of you to share my troubles, so he appreciated the fact that they were sharing. Okay. Going back to verse 230, he says to the Philippians that Aphrodite supplied your lack of service toward me. Okay. So they didn't always help All right. I, I want to go back to two and three that these are peacemakers. He was trying to make peace between those two women. So there was a peacemaking trade about this. Okay. Uh, Paul was definitely a team player. You see that uh, in there. Good. All right, let's move to Timothy. Uh, we don't have near the information on Timothy. What the first thing he's a companion of Paul. He's a co writer. Yeah, I, I guess it would be a question of whether he was a co writer or if he just was present with Paul, a companion of Paul, and he's sending his greetings and everything with Paul. I don't think you could build a case that he was an author of uh, Philippians. Okay, what's your next point on it? Verse 19, he had no one like him. He said he has no one like him. Okay. Uh, we'll comment on that here in a minute. Uh, or we'll reference it again. He was going to be sent to Philippi. We know that Paul is saying, I'm going to send you to Philippi. And it's kind of interesting because he said, as soon as I find out how it's going to go for me, uh, I'll be sending him. So he's like-minded with Paul. In verses 19, 20, we've got several things there. Uh, Shirley's picking it up. He's like-minded with Paul. He was an outstanding servant. He was genuinely concerned for their welfare, all of these things in that one little section. Now, let's look for a second at there's no one like him. Okay, uh, we need to identify right away that has to do with the next method we're going to look at. Was there anybody like him? Was there anybody like him with that criteria? Okay, when Paul says there's no one like him, does Paul mean that literally and concretely? Was Silas like him? In some ways. Pardon? Certainly in some ways. Yeah, so in, in, the, in the ways that Paul is describing, Silas could fit that bill. So Paul is using a figure of speech here, that Timothy was outstanding. He wasn't necessarily uh, making a declaration that absolutely nobody was in the same league as Timothy. 
Uh, he's using a figure of speech there, and we'll be looking at the, our next method is going to be the rhetorical method, uh, where we look at some of the figures of speech that are used in some of the more common figures of speech. But what, he, what figure would this be? Uh, he's probably using a hyperbole here, an over-exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. What he's really saying is he's outstanding. You know, and uh, you can, uh, sometime you'll eat something that somebody made and you'll say, oh, there's nobody cooks like so-and-so. Well, there are. She just was outstanding for pork and beans or something, you know. Uh, uh, so that's a totally legitimate thing. Uh, it isn't that Paul missed it or he's inaccurate or anything. Uh, totally legitimate. Uh, in verse 21, he was proven. He was proven. Uh, and that's a, uh, an important thing. Uh, because uh, do you get proven quickly? You might, if there's a big crisis and you come through or something, uh, that might be quickly. But usually it takes a period of time. Uh, and it takes a period of time for people not only to see your strengths, but also what? Weaknesses. See your weaknesses. Uh, but Timothy was proven. Uh, it wasn't that Timothy showed up today. Can you think of a character uh, where he's described and he failed to prove himself? And actually caused a bit of trouble. John Mark with Paul. John Mark with Paul. And Paul said, I won't take him. He, he's unproven. But Paul wasn't just hard-nosed, because later he writes, and he said, bring him. He's profitable for me in the ministry. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's, it's important, and it's important to wait people out until they're proven. Uh, uh, Paul writing to, right now the reference slips to me, it says, lay hands no, quickly on nobody. And what he's saying is don't install people in leadership quickly. Let them be proven and then uh, fill the position. Timothy had a father-son relationship with Paul. And verse 22, he had served with Paul in the gospel. Anybody have anything else on Timothy? We're kind of pushing here because we're coming up on the end of the hour. Uh, Epaphroditus. What did you come up with there? In 2.26, Good. Okay. In 25, we have a couple things. He was a brother in Christ to Paul. He was Paul's fellow worker, and he was Paul's fellow soldier, and a Philippian messenger, and that he ministered to Paul's needs. Uh, there had been a gap there uh, where the Philippians hadn't been able to communicate and, and contribute to Paul. Now Epaphroditus had come with the contribution. And then uh, Joanne picking up, he had a strong affection uh, for him because uh, they had uh, Philippians. He was homesick. Epaphroditus was homesick. He was distressed because they had heard that he was sick. Uh, verse 27. What do we see? He had been near death, but God healed him. Healed him. In verse 29, he was worthy of honor. 30, for the work of Christ, pardon? Yeah, he had risked his life for the cause of Christ and to meet Paul's needs. He had risked his life to meet Paul's needs. Okay, now, uh, has the, the study of these characters contributed to your understanding of the book, your your um, 
your feel for the book, your feel for what's going on in the, uh, in the work. Uh, definitely worth an investment of your time and energy, isn't it? As you, as you go at that. Uh, and uh, that's why you want to really learn to be efficient in these uh, methods. And they're not hard. You know, this, this isn't rocket science. Uh, it, we're just been going through and saying, hey, what can we learn about this person? And what contribution does that make to our understanding of the book? Uh, and uh, we've been now, what, uh, almost, have we been a year in Flip? Not quite, because we came back after the, uh, we've been about uh, eight, nine or ten months in there, uh, because I think we have, after the two and a half months, then we still went another, we've probably been seven or eight months. Seven or eight months in the book, and uh, all, all we've been kind of doing is saturating ourselves in it. But we've been coming at it a little different way each time. And that, uh, that keeps adding to our knowledge of, of Philippians uh, and our understanding of the Philippians. And we haven't even started Philippians going verse by verse uh, to pull the thing together. Uh, we want to and we will, but uh, all of this is, is just looking at how, how uh, different ways that we can look at the book in order to absorb more and in order to let it make a more uh, lasting impact on us. Uh, uh, for next week, uh, read the book of Philippians again uh, in one of the translations. Uh, I would recommend a different translation than you've been reading. And then uh, just to refresh yourself in that, and then we'll be going on the rhetorical method next week. Uh, and then we'll give you a big assignment for the two weeks that we're not going to meet. We will meet next week, then we won't meet for two weeks, and then we will, uh, and then we'll pick back up again. Uh, any questions? You did really good. I. Uh, I'm really, um, I'm thrilled at all that you came up with that I had missed. Uh, I'm, I'm just thrilled with that, yeah. Uh, I hate to admit I haven't checked my email, but did you send it up that you would like to? I did. Uh, Carol, did you get yours? Did I get what? The text that I sent on email? Or was it Joanne? Two people asked for it. Uh, and oh, Yeah, Gary, if you would check, to, and if you didn't get it, let me know, because I did send it. Yeah, Carol, I did send it to you, too, the, just the text with the paragraph divisions. I sent it to your email. Uh, okay, we'll check that. I sent it to Carol Overnell, capital C and capital O, at gmail.com. No capitals. Pardon? It won't matter. It won't? Anyway, if you didn't get it, email me and say, hey, I didn't get it, and we'll try it again. But I'll have your email. I'll have your email to go against. Okay, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We love you. We love each other. We pray that you just pour out your spirit on the service now. In Jesus' name, amen.